first of all, God has not put you on a shelf because God says don't waste time, right? He's the one that says in the Bible, redeem the time. So he's not put you on a shelf until he wants to use you. He's not abandoned you because you've done something wrong. He's not, um, he's not punishing you. He is preparing you. In a situation where you thought, God, where are you? Where you feel like his presence is a million miles away and his promises that he's made to you is even further. That's what we're talking about tonight. And the thing that I'm going to show you in this program is that God is not far from you. You have not been put on a shelf. You are not in a negative place. You're not being punished. You are being prepared for something wow. very important. Beautiful. And so this is what we're going to talk about tonight because here's the thing. When we understand, the Bible says um, there's, a, there's a purpose for every season under heaven. Hmm. If we understand the purpose, then we behave correctly. The children of Israel didn't understand the purpose of the wilderness, so they behaved incorrectly. The result was what was only supposed to be a one-year short stint ended up becoming a lifetime. Right. And so what my passion right now is, um, I don't want to see believers in the body of Christ. I don't want to see them spend a lifetime in the wilderness. You can't shorten a wilderness season, but you can certainly lengthen it. Got it. And I don't want to see anybody lengthen it longer than it needs to be. It's a very important time that we're going to talk about in this program. But if we don't behave correctly, if we don't have the why, the understanding, we will because we'll feel like God's abandoned us. And so that's what I really want to talk about tonight. Has it happened to you? Oh, my gosh, many times. But the first two times, I, I, I've gone through seasons of wilderness in my life, okay? The first two were both about 18 months long each. And most of this book is writ written out of those experiences because I was so frustrated. I kept saying, God, I don't get it. Where, you know, I, I remember, you know, when I got saved, you know, I was raised in the church and um, I didn't know God. I had no relationship with God. So it was very obvious. So people are witnessing to me in high school, right? <laughs> They're witnessing to me in college. <laughs> and yet here I am playing varsity tennis at Purdue University. I'm playing junior Davis Cup tennis, the USTA. I'm having my coach take me to, to mass every single week, but I have no idea who Jesus is, right? And so this one guy who actually, he left my room, he told me after I got saved, my freshman year of college, he said in tears because I was not even connecting to what he was saying. Mm -hmm. My sophomore year, one of, and, and athletics was my life, one of the most phenomenal athletes in Purdue University was in my fraternity. He came up to my room one night, and while he's sharing with me, I realize God really wanted to reveal himself to me wow. personally, wow. that he cared about me deeply that he loved me uniquely, mm -hmm. that he actually wanted to make promises to me as a, as a father would make to his children, right? That he actually had crafted a plan for my life. Well, that night as he shared, my eyes were open and I received Jesus. And what was so amazing to me, Lori, is the presence of God. Um, and it's a part of our Christian life because Jesus said, I will manifest myself to you. Right. So manifest means bring from the unseen into the seen, the unheard into the heard, the unknown into the known. It's when God makes himself real to our senses. His, his presence was like overwhelming. And I'm like, all the success I had in tennis, the success I had in school, the, um, uh, the girls I dated, the masses that I went to every week, hmm. what none of that could fill, he instantly filled with his presence. So... The first couple years I'm walking with God, it's like I just whisper his name and he's there. Wow. I'm, I'm going to services and I'm crying. I remember watching a thunderstorm build in Raleigh, North Carolina, and I just start tearing up thinking my dad hmm. has created all of this. And so this is hilarious. One thing that the, the way he answered prayers was unbelievable. One time I remember my cassette player in my car. <laughs> Does anybody know what that is? Does anybody know? What, do you know what a cassette yeah. is? It's, it's a dinosaur, right? So I'm sitting there. It broke. So I can't listen to worship. I can't listen to my teaching tapes. And I'm like, Jesus, you said lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. I put my hands on the cassette player, right? And I took them off. I did it again, and it started playing, and it never broke again. Wow. Wow. And, and, but then all of a sudden, after a couple years, his presence became very elusive. And he's not answering prayers quickly. And it seems like I'm not moving towards promises. I'm moving away from promises that he's made me. And the overarching question 
in my heart was, God, where are you? Yeah. And this is what I want to help people understand. Because the first thing you start thinking is, what sin have I committed? Yeah. Okay, that's where your mind goes immediately. But you're in trouble. Am I not reading the Bible enough? Am I not praying? That is so ridiculous. Okay. And I want that off your mind right now. No, you didn't commit a, a sin. You are, you know, if you have, you'll know, confess it. But I'm looking for something that's not there. I mean, with all my heart, I'm living the best I can. I'm in love with Jesus. And I'm like, you're, you're abandoning me. Wow. So um, I go through 18 months of this. And the cries that I had in my heart, I, I just couldn't get it. But then one day, I saw what Job said. Job said, look, I go forward, but he's not there. And backward, I can't perceive him. When he works on my right hand. So he's working on Job's behalf, but Job can't perceive it. Hmm. He said, but when he's tested me, I shall come forth as pure gold. Oh, there's so much in this. I mean, I, I, I could literally go for an hour on this. But what God is, first of all, God has not put you on a shelf because God says don't waste time, right? He's the one that says in the Bible, redeem the time. So he's not put you on a shelf until he wants to use you. He's not abandoned you because you've done something wrong. He's not, um, he's not punishing you. He is preparing. Preparing you. God, when he, he, he does this with every child, there's a three-step pathway to our destiny. First of all, he'll make us a promise, mm -hmm. okay? He does it with every child. He'll give you glimpses of where you're going, right? I have, I have a file folder in my desk of things God showed me in 1981 that I didn't start fulfilling until I was in my 50s. Yeah. Okay, so he'll make promises. And if you're thinking out there, well, that hasn't happened with me. I'm going to challenge you, and, and it, it, please understand, I'm saying this out of a deep, deep love for you. The Bible says that God rewards those who diligently seek him in faith. The Bible does not say that God will reward those who casually seek him in wonder and doubt. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm young. I'm in college. I literally, this is going to seem stupid, but it, I believe it was smart. <laughs> I walked off the tennis team at Purdue University as a starter because I had no time for God, mm. because the studies were engineering and they were too difficult. So I've never regretted that decision, not once, okay? But what I did is I'm out, you know, near my fraternity on the golf course at night, praying, crying out to God, and God's giving me glimpses. Once that happens, he gives you a promise, then comes the process. The process is the wilderness, right. okay? This is where he develops in you the character handle the promise. Wow. And then the third step is the promotion, which is the promise fulfilled. If you look at Joseph, when he shows up in the Bible, we, we, you know, he is one of, he is my favorite. He and Daniel are my two favorites in the Old Testament. Just, I love them. And I'll tell you why, as I walk through this, if, when you look at Joseph, when he shows up in the scene, the second verse, it says, he told his dad some bad things his brothers were doing. So he's a tattletale. Yep. All right. <laughs> verse eight, verse eight, he is bragging about he's got the robe of many colors, so he's proud, right? And the, verse 8 in the New Living says it so well that he's speaking down to his brothers. Yeah. So we got a tattletale, a boaster, and somebody, and he's bragging about his dreams, and he's talking down to people. If God would have fulfilled the vision of that leadership at that time, yeah. we would have had a very narcissistic, it, yeah. insecure leader. Mm -hmm. See, Saul never went through a wilderness. David, David did. did. Yeah. Saul did not finish well. He had this humility that looked like it was real, but it wasn't. I mean, he's hiding in the equipment when they, he's called. His name is called. But if you look at his first major victory, he builds a monument to himself. So his, <laughs> his humility was completely... <laughs> Off the radar. It was, <laughs> it was superficial. Right. Yeah. It wasn't genuine humility. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and, and I think it's really funny. If you look at Moses, he goes through a 40-year wilderness, and yet he writes in Numbers 12, Moses was the most humble man in the whole earth. I mean, who writes there that, that they are the most humble man in the whole earth? <laughs> Somebody who's truly humble because he understands what true humility is, his complete, utter dependence on God yeah. and his passionate love for other people. But here goes Joseph, and we all know Joseph's story, so I'm not going to take time on this. Sold as a slave, thrown in a pit, which pit stands for preachers in training. I'm sure you've heard that on TV <laughs> a few times. Then he sold as a slave for 10 years. Now, what we don't understand in the Western world is back then when you're sold as a slave to a foreign nation, 
you're going to be a slave the rest of your life. Your wife's going to be a slave. Your children are going to be slaves. Now, it's one thing to be born a slave. It's a completely, totally different scenario. When you've been born the heir of a very wealthy man, and you're the favored son, and you have it all stripped away from you by your brothers, and now you're in slavery for 10 years. Okay, so let's, let's think. 10 years ago. How, that's a long time ago, right? All right, so he's, God's always blessing you no matter where you are. He's doing all right, but something very bad is happening. The master's wife, because he's in one of the king's officer's home as a slave, his wife gets the hots for him, and she doesn't approach him once. She approaches him every day. Okay, now think about it. This woman's dressed in the best, she's scented in the best, and she's got a seducing spirit probably up to her eyeballs, right? right? She doesn't approach him just once. She approaches him every day. And I love how he obeys the word of God. He goes, no, no, he resists it every day. Now, the thing we got to remember is he doesn't have a connect group. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have a pastor. Right. Nobody knows who he is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yet he's still obeying God. But now we're looking at 10 years where not one ounce of the vision that God's given him has come to pass, yet he's still obeying God. This is what people do when they go into a desert time. Hey. They go, I'm, they, they get passive aggressive and they say, I'm going to take it out on God by not obeying you. Now, none of us would ever say that, but this is what the way people think deep down. It's almost like I'm going to get a little revenge because, God, you're not moving the way I think you should be moving in my life. <laughs> okay? But he doesn't do this. He obeys. And I love what Paul says to the Philippian church. He says in Philippians 2.12, as you have obeyed in my presence, even now much more obey in my absence and work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. So Joseph fears God, which means you know, that, that's not Paul speaking to the Philippians. That's God speaking to us. It's easy to obey God when we're in the conference. The anointing's there. Somebody's worshiping. We got tears pouring down our face. But what about when you've been gossiped at work and you are losing your job or your kid is throwing up at midnight? That's when the rubber meets the road. And what Paul's saying is, you have done so well. And this is actually God saying, you have obeyed even in my absence, in the absence of my presence. Joseph's in Egypt. No church, no fellowship, no Bible, and yet he's obeying God. He's, he's resisting, right? So then she grabs him by the road. One day, they're, they're in the house alone. You know, she's probably working it up. She's got a little breast showing. She's probably got a leg out one side of the slit of her outfit. And she comes up and goes, nobody's going to know. Nobody is going to know. Come on. I'm all yours. My husband's away. And I love what this man does. He flees sexual immorality. He does exactly what the Word of God says. What does it end up getting him? It gets him the dungeon. Now, in America, our prisons are country clubs compared to a Middle Eastern dungeon. Right. I just preached in the largest prison in the United States six months ago. Okay? It's called Angola. It's in Louisiana. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So I've been in Middle Eastern dungeons. They're usually hewned out cisterns. They're about, they're about four feet tall. And the Bible says they laid his feet in irons and hurt his feet with fetters. Right? They're four feet tall, no sun. It's usually damp because it used to be a cistern, okay? He's chained. This is, this is no, there, there's no television. There's, yeah. there's, there, there's no basketball courts. He's in the ground. And they would give them the bread of affliction, which is this. They don't want him to die because dying's too easy. So they give him just enough bread and water to keep them alive because they want him to suffer. So he's in this dungeon, and then God brings the greatest test to Joseph. Now, what's the greatest test? And, and by the way, everybody's so down on tests. Why? Because of our midterms and our finals. Test is actually a good thing. I flew over the ocean three nights ago, okay? I am so glad the pilot passed the test yeah. because he and I <laughs> didn't end up in the ocean. Yeah. God said, Israel, I brought you out in this water so you could find out what was in your heart. So anyway, that's another story. <laughs> So God brings the greatest test to Joseph. What is it? He brings two men, the butler and the baker. We all know that, right? Right? They just had dreams last night. What's the test? Can Joseph proclaim to them the faithfulness of God? In a dream. <laughs> in prison. When he hasn't yeah. seen yeah. one ounce of faithfulness of God in his life in regard to his dream in over 10 years. Yeah. Think about it. God says, your brother's going to serve you. You're going to be a leader. Your brothers will serve you. And even your mom and dad will be under your leadership. And he doesn't see one ounce of it come to pass. On top of that, he just preaches the dream. It gets him the pit in slavery. He resists and obeys God and flees sexual immorality, and it gets him the dungeon. So the more he's obeying God in the wilderness, the worse his life becomes. Wow. Yeah. Now, can he proclaim to the butler and the baker the faithfulness of God when he hasn't seen one shred of evidence in, it in his own life for 10 years? 
If Joseph would have been like a lot of us, you know what he would have said? You had a dream last night? Yeah. Leave me alone. I had a dream once. Dreams don't come true. Wow. Leave me alone. Wow. Now, if he would have done that, he would have died in that dungeon, and you would have died saying, God's not faithful. He doesn't keep his promises. Wow. When in reality, God is faithful, and God was using all of this to prepare Joseph to have the character to handle because we see he interprets the dreams. This guy obeys God when nothing is going right. And, and so the guy gets promoted, and he forgets about him. Now he's in there for two more years. Think about being in that condition, bread of affliction, chains in a, in a, in a, in a, in a dungeon for two more years. Seeing other people's dreams come true. Knowing yes. that yeah. his family's yeah. all having... Oh, they forgot the about him. Yeah. yeah. So now, one day, we all know, Pharaoh has a dream. The butler goes, oh, my gosh, I forgot all about the guy in the dungeon. He gets promoted to number two in all of Egypt, and really number two in the world because Egypt's the most powerful nation. Yeah. So then we've got seven years of plenty, and now we have two more years of famine. So we're talking 19 years. And finally, here comes the brothers. So we, we can see that the dream that God gave him, it took 19 years. And it said, Joseph remembered. And that word remember doesn't go, oh, I just remembered. That word remembered means he kept it before him the whole way. And that's what kept him obeying God the whole way. Wow. So now, if he would have been in the dungeon saying, if I ever get a hold of these guys, I'll kill them. <laughs> God would have had to leave him in the dungeon to rot too. Why? Because he would have killed 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel, including Judah, whom Jesus and David came through. Wow. Right? But he blesses them. Yeah. And he gives one of them five times. So Joseph now has the character to handle this position of leadership. So whenever God is doing something in you, you have to say to yourself, wow, he's going to entrust me with the ability to impact other people's lives in a profound way that I could never do, and he's preparing me for the character to have it. I love it. And that's the way we need to view the wilderness. But, okay, so I have a problem sometimes. Which is that, what? It, that we complain and we murmur sometimes, and you just go, really, God? This is going to happen now. I just got through this, and now this, and now this, you know, and you start questioning God, where does that, where, where does that get us? The murmur it's thing. It's terrible. It's complaining. And you talk so good about that in this book. <laughs> so one day I'm just reading 1 Corinthians 10, and I see the list that really keeps them out of their destiny, the children of Israel. Yeah. And I'm seeing sexual immorality. I'm seeing tempting Christ. I'm seeing building idols, uh, sins in, like that. I'm like, whoa, those are serious. And then the fifth one is complaining. And I'm like, okay, God, <laughs> how can you put that in that list, wow. right? Wow. And the Holy Spirit said, complaining is a very serious thing. Mm. And I said, why? He said, it's, a, it's, a, it's the evidence of a lack of holy fear. He said, because complaining says straight to my face, God, I don't like what you're doing in my life right now. And if I were you, God, I would be doing this differently. Mm -hmm. He said, it is an absolute disregard for the process that I'm preparing wow. for you for. If you look at the children of Israel, well, let, let, me, let me back up here. Let, let me, let me, look, since we just went through Joseph, let me, let me set it up this way. If you look at Joseph's life, you know what it shows us? That no man, no woman, no child, no organization, no devil can ever get us out of the will of God. Got it. Out of the destiny that God has prepared for us. Right. I mean, Joseph's brother said, we're killing him, and we'll see what becomes of this dream, right? They purposely tried to thwart the destiny of God on Joseph, and yet they were the very ones God says, because God's not bound to time. He knows the end from the beginning. God says, oh, yeah, you think you're going to thwart this? I'm going to use it to put him into his destiny. So the only one that can get you out of your destiny is you. Got it. So God intends the children of Israel to go into the desert for one year because he wants to train them to be able to conquer that land. He said, if I bring them this way, they're going to be war. I'm going to bring them to the desert. So I'm going to train their character so they'll be ready, right? But they complain, and they complain, and they complain. Now, here's the thing that all of us have to realize. We have points in our life where we, what I'd like to call their life-defining moments. If you look at Rehoboam, he's, he's Solomon's son. He's growing up going, my dad's counselors are so old-fashioned, you know, all this, right? So he's got this thing going, right? His friends, they're making fun of his dad's counselors. So now he's king. And his life-defining moment comes. Israel comes, says, hey, your dad was a little hard on us. And his dad's counselor said, give him grace. Let, loosen, loosen the yokes. And, and then he goes to his friends, 
those old fogies, show them who's boss, you know? And he does it, and he loses more than half of his kingdom. He loses 10 of the 12 tribes. Yeah. If you look at Israel, they got a pattern of complaining, all right? We're not enough water, you know, they just watched the Red Sea parted, and three days later, we don't have enough water, right? And on and on and on. So now their life-defining moment comes. They don't know it's their life-defining moment. It's when the spies return, and they re resort to their complaining. God has brought us out here to kill us. Oh, my gosh, it was so much better for us back in Egypt, right? They get, they get the rest of their life in the desert. So the destiny God created for them, what he promised them, you will enter into your promised land, doesn't go to them, it goes to their children. So I'm at the point, you know, where, when Lisa and I, this is, this is going to be, this may sound harsh, <laughs> but this is becoming so real to me that we decided with our children, we would discipline them for complaining like rebellion. Wow. I okay? like it. So we, we, we had a no complaining thing Pause. in our household, okay? So I'm, I'm getting almost to the point where I'm proud because I'm not complaining, no matter what I'm going through, right? And one day I wake up on this fast. I'll never forget, I was in the mountains of Georgia. And I hear the Holy Spirit so clearly say, as soon as my eyes open up, I hear the complaining in your heart. Oh my goodness. My feet didn't touch the floor. I rolled out of the bed and straight to my knees and I said, God, I'm so sorry. And I realized that he hears our hearts. Jesus knew their thoughts. He said, which is easier to say, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And I realized that that's really where it is. That's where it counts. Yeah. And, and so the, the thing, and this is why, I, and, and I'm not trying to sell a book, okay? This is a life message for me. Yeah. And can, can you take from a guy who's turning 60 this year? Okay. <laughs> I, <laughs> And I would will, I will call you young man from the Yes, time. thank you, uncle, yeah. <laughs> I've gone through a lot of wildernesses and I have made mistakes and I've prolonged probably some seasons and I don't want you to do that. Hmm. I need you to enter into your promised, fulfilled promise because all of us have to get this job done. We have nations, we have cities, we have, we have so many people that need Jesus. But yet God loves you more than what he loves that you do for him. So God wants this character in you so that what he wants you to do doesn't destroy you like it did with Saul. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the body of Christ prophetically. Let me, let me, let me go to a little overarching here. When I, in the early 1980s, I was a member of a church and I was the executive assistant to the pastor. We had 450 staff members and it was probably the best known church in the United States. We had four night seminars. In these meetings, we literally had a wall filled with wheelchairs, you know, walkers. I would watch and I'm the executive assistant to the pastor. So I know it's true. I know it's not fake. I'm watching a guy come in with a red and white. I know he's blind because I know they're bringing him and he walks out seeing. I watched the ambulance pull up. And the paramedics roll a guy who has less than 24 hours left to live. And the guy gets up and he's so healed, he pushes his gurney out. Wow. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Uh, my pastor's walking down the aisle on a typical Sunday night and he's joking around and he looks at this guy and he reads his mail. He was the grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. <laughs> he had his grand wizard uniform under the seat and a gun under that. And he said, God, if you're not real tonight, I'm taking my life. And you're going to have to show me you're real. He walks into our church with 4,000 people in the sanctuary. And our pastor is joking while he's walking down the aisle and then all of a sudden goes, you, and reads his mail. Jesus appears in one of our services with two angels. 800 people on the right balcony scream, okay? Simultaneous. It was like that. Wow. Leaves an imprint of his face on the wall that stayed there for a year and a half. Okay, I saw it with my own two eyes. So I'm thinking, this is, this is normal Christianity, right? <laughs> and God speaks to me in the midst of all this because I'm the guy that's picking up all the guest speakers, right? God speaks to me in the midst of this and said, I've given a thimble full of my power to my church. Wow. He said, to see how she'd handle it. See if she's going to market it, make money off of it, if she's going to use it to promote, them, use it to promote themselves. He said... We didn't handle it well. Let's just leave it there. 
Half of those guys I picked up in the van, I don't want to say half, many of those people I had picked up in the van, who the people got out of the wheelchair, aren't even in ministry. My own pastor is not even in the ministry anymore today, to my knowledge, and the 4,000 seat auditorium was condemned. And I, I love that. I love this man so deeply. And I loved all these people so deeply, but we didn't handle it well. And with all due respect, if I was in this position, I would have done the same thing, okay? Because I had a lot of character development that needed to be done. So let, let's not be thinking about that, okay? Let's, let's look at what happened. God spoke to me and said, I'm going to bring my church into a wilderness. Wow. And he said, when she comes out, I gave her thimbleful. When she comes out, she will operate in the greatest Thank amount of my presence and power that this earth has ever seen. Thank you, Lord. Now, here's the thing. The greatest attack against us in the wilderness comes just before we come out of it. So if you look at Jesus, he's in the wilderness being tempted. I mean, he get, God affirms him, you're my son, publicly. Then the Holy Spirit leads him to the wilderness to be tempted of the yes. devil. But, he goes, but Luke's gospel, we all know this, says he goes into the wilderness, filled with the Spirit, but he returns in the power thereof. Mm -hmm. James says, blessed is the man that endures temptation. After he's tried, he'll receive the crown of life. We're thinking crown in heaven. No, 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 no. Well, yeah, that's probably true. But crown speaks of authority. With authority comes power. So Jesus comes out in the power thereof, right? So... God showed me the church is going to come out with such power because she'll now have the character to handle it. But what I was sensing last year, and I said to my team, I said, we need to get this book out as fast as possible, hmm. is that these greatest attacks are going to come against the harvest just at the end. L look at David. 14 years he's in the desert. But what happens at the very end? The Amalekites kidnap his wives and children and his men's wives and children. They steal all their precious possessions. And he comes back, they find it, and now the last 600 guys that believe in you on the earth want to kill you. Yeah. So the greatest attack came just before he came out. So I feel in my heart, prophetically, we have to be prepared. And I believe this is a resource tool to strengthen us so that we don't become complainers. And in our crucial life-defining moment, not, not do what Joseph did, we'll do what Israel did if that makes sense. Yeah. And so that's why I feel so urgent about this message. John, while you were talking just now, what if um, tonight's broadcast is signaling hmm. that change? What if we are, as a collective church, coming out of some kind of testing? Okay, so what if we're signaling that with, with basically this this book could make us understand that. So prophetically, you got this book done in time. We're sitting here now, okay? Why don't you take an opportunity, just look in the camera, pray for the people that are watching and here in the studio. Absolutely. You know, I know you don't even have to tell me. I know you've been going through such struggles. You're going through the same questions of, God, why, aren't, why does it seem like I'm going backward? You've made me promises, and yet I'm not moving towards them. I'm moving away from them. Why is it that I'm having so much turmoil in my home, on my job, in the church, whatever it is, and you just can't figure it out? I just want to pray. I want to pray that God would strengthen you. Peter didn't pray that Peter would avert the trial. Mm. He prayed that his faith wouldn't right. fail. Right. And that's what I feel led of the Spirit to pray for you right now because listen to me well. Hmm. The most valuable times of my life are those wildernesses that I wrote about. Yeah. I hated them when I was in the middle of them. Yeah. I, I, I absolutely couldn't stand them. Yeah. But I look back and I realize that is where God revealed himself to me. John the Baptist was in the deserts until the day of his manifestation. And what happened? Annas and Caiaphas are doing their religious thing as being high priests, but yet he meets God in the wilderness. The word of the Lord came to him in the wilderness. Moses on the backside of the desert but God reveals himself to him in a burning bush. Joseph is getting dreams, uh, or the, how, the, the ability to interpret dreams in the middle of the desert, I, or in the middle of the dungeon. I could go on and on. The wilderness, one of the great things about it is where God reveals himself. Yes. 90% of what I preach and teach today came out of the rough, roughest wow. times of my life. Wow. It's true. You will look back at this time if you continue to trust God if you continue to speak, because Malachi tells us, and I hope I'm not running out of time. Oh. I, I, okay, yeah. Malachi tells us, Malachi is a prophetic book. 
of not just the days of John the Baptist and Jesus. It's a prophetic book of the last days. It says there's going to be three types of people. There's going to be wicked. The wicked are the people that don't serve God. There's going to be the complaining Christians and the non-complaining wow. Christians. The complaining Christians, you know what they're going to say? God said, your words are harsh against me. And they're going to say, what have we said harsh against you? He said, it's use, you, he said to them, you have said that it is useless to serve me. Wow. What profit is it that we've obeyed God because we look at the proud, the wicked, and they're blessed. Wow. They're not going through the problems I'm going through. And he said, but then there's this group of people that fear the Lord. They're Christians. They're going through the same trials as the complainers. And those who feared the Lord spoke to one another. They spoke to one another the covenant of God. And God said, they're going to be mine in the days that I make them my jewels, jewels refined in the fire. If you look at gold, Job said, after he tests me, I shall come forth as pure gold. Pure gold is tender, soft, pliable. 14 karat gold is not pure. It's hard. If you look at pure gold, it has a counterpart called brass. Brass tarnishes because of the atmosphere. Pure gold can never tarnish. So do you realize that when we come through these times, we're not tarnished by the atmosphere of the world that we live in. Yeah. And if you look at pure gold in heaven, it's transparent. You can see through it just like glass. When, when God tests us and we come forth as pure gold, now the people see the treasure in us, not us. Wow. They see Jesus. Beautiful. That's my cry. Yeah. When they see these eyes, let them see your eyes. When they hear these words, let them hear your words. When I embrace, let them feel your embrace. That's my cry. That's your cry. That's why God has privileged you to go through this time of training. And when you see it that way, see, life is all about a perceptive. Jesus said the light of the body is the eye. It's the way you perceive things. And you see this as, God, you've forsaken me. God, you, my family's going through this. My, I just got fired. You have missed what God is doing. Wow. You, you've seen the glass half full, so sort to of, sort of speak, instead of the way it really is, it's half empty and going to be full and overflowing. Yeah. God has privileged you hmm. to go through this time because he's got something much bigger than you could ever handle with the character you had before you went into this season. And so I pray Thank that you. your faith doesn't Thank fail. You, Father, I pray for Thank every you. man, woman, Thank you, Father. every young man and woman that's watching right now. They're in a time. They're in a time of testing, and a time of testing is not negative like midterms and finals. Father, it is a time Jesus. where we will come forth as pure gold, and I speak to yes. the demonic forces that have lied to you, and I command them to stop their attacks against my brother and sister. But this is what I most pray for them, Father. I pray that their faith doesn't fail. Thank you, Lord. Because, Lord, you said these trials that we go, they show that our faith is genuine. I pray that God shows you. He knows your faith is genuine, that you see that your faith is genuine, and that you keep speaking his promises, and don't forget what he has promised you, because he is faithful to bring it to pass. So, Lord, strengthen my brothers and sisters, and may their faith grow stronger in this season. In Jesus' name. You said something a while ago that nothing and nobody can stop the destiny that God has except you. Yes. So, so that means you can't blame anybody. Right. You can't blame anything. You can't blame any person hmm. that they got that job, they stole that job. You know, I was kicked out of that ministry or there are no excuses. Complaining and excuses is the enemy to preparation for your future. Yes. yes. And that's what most people do. Is that, is that kind of the main thing that we, is that our go-to typically? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, um, That they know, got the promotion, all that stuff. It, 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 you, you'll manifest in many ways. I mean, I mean the very <laughs> first wilderness that I went through. You manifest. So God, yeah, you manifest. <laughs> well, I'm going to show you, okay? Okay, okay. all right. So, um, yeah, let's I'm in a church that we predominantly speak. This is that big church that I was telling you yeah. about. We only taught on faith, on miracles, right? We didn't talk about character. Got it. It just was never mentioned. So I'm out praying one night. Lisa and I have no children. Um, oh, actually, we just had Addison. He's like, he's like six months old. Okay. And God says to me, I'm going to teach you to deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. Okay. I'm going to begin to do a work of holiness in your life. And I was so excited. I left the field because it was nighttime. I ran back to the apartment that Lisa and I were living in. And I said, she's taking off her makeup, getting ready for bed. And I said, babe, babe, God just spoke to me. He's going to begin to do a work of holiness in my life. 
I was so excited. I said, Lisa, all this excessive TV I watch is going to leave. All the sports I watch on TV is going to leave. I said, all the eating I do, because I, I, food was an idol for me. I'd eat when I wasn't hungry just because I wanted to eat. I said, he's going to take it all out of my life. And I said, I'm going to be holy, right? So we never heard about this, okay? So the next three months, I'm twice as fleshly. I'm watching twice as much TV. I'm eating twice as much. So three months later, I go out and I go, God, what's going on? You said you're going to do this work of holiness. I, I, I've been twice as fleshly the last three months. He said, that's because you're doing it your way. He said, holiness is not a work of your flesh. It's a product of my grace. He said, son, now I'm going to do it my way. So I'm reporting to the pastor, right? And they moved me closer because they loved me so much. They wanted me in closer proximity, but it didn't work out. So we had already hired somebody to take my other position. So all of a sudden now they have to find a place for me to work in the organization. And it was in satellite sales. Those are the guys that called the pastors and tried to sell them satellite time for our four-night conferences. And so now I'm working for a woman who works to, who, who reports to a man who reports to the pastor. So I've been demoted three levels and I haven't done anything. And I'm going through all these trials like I can't believe. So here's my response. During this time, I'm mad at my wife. <laughs> I'm, I'm yelling at her. Oh, I'm like, like it's I, her fault. <laughs> I'm even yelling at my son. I'm mad at my coworkers. I'm mad at my friends because my friends aren't giving me the sympathy I feel like I should be getting. I mean, I've done nothing wrong, and I've been demoted three levels. I'm really upset with my pastor. I'm, I'm, I'm upset with everybody, and I'm, I'm spouting off. I'm angry, all this. So six months of this goes by, and I, I go out and pray again in that same field, and I say, God, I, where's all this anger coming from? Where's this bitterness coming from? I said, what do I bind? What do I cast out? The Lord said, you don't cast out flesh. You crucify it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, remember, I remember I said, God, I wasn't even this angry before I got saved. <laughs> Where is this coming from? I'm going backwards. And, and the Lord showed me my, my ring on my finger. It, it was 14 karat gold, which means 14 parts out of 24 parts is gold. 10 parts is impurities, copper, zinc, nickel. Now, I've got an engineering background, so he talks to me like this. He goes, if you put that ring in a furnace and heat it up a couple thousand degrees, what happens? I said, it liquefies. He said, then what happens? I said, well, the lighter metals, the impurities, the copper, zinc, and nickel begins to surface. Right? Because they're lighter than the gold. He said, they appear, right? And I said, finger comes up. yeah. Mm -hmm. He said, you didn't see them before it went into the furnace, but they appear when it goes into the furnace. I said, yeah. He said, all this anger, it's in you. He said, I knew it was there. He said, I'm letting you see it. He said, oh. now, if you, if you blame your pastor, your wife, your coworkers, your friends, it'll all go back down, and we got to start all over again. He said, wow. or you can own it. And he said, if you own it, you'll confess it and ask me to take it away. And he said, I'll ladle, I'll skim off those impurities right out of your Thank life. Thank you, Lord. Wow. Wow. So, so what was my response? There, you just got it. I was a terror to live with, and my friends were pulling away from me because I'm so grumpy. I'm so, I'm so, I'm, I'm carrying, I'm carrying around the wilderness. I'm wearing it. See, remember Jesus said, you know, don't appear to men to be this way. You know, it's one thing to have joy when everything's going great, people like you. Can you have that same joy, that wow. same demeanor of I love God and love life when you're going through hell? Wow. Only people that have come through the wilderness successfully have that. Wilderness has been <laughs> redefined yeah. while we've been sitting here. It's preparation. If you don't complain you get to see what God took you to the wilderness to show you, and then you get to confess it, walk away from it, and be prepared for something new. And can I say, you, it's, it's, it's accurate that you say it's redefined, but I believe what it really is is we had a wrong definition. Yeah. And now we're getting the true, the true reality of what it is. Yeah. And so our perception was wrong, and now we're seeing it correctly. And yeah. yes, we must redefine it. So... I think the definition of redefine is what I said. Yes, so, yeah. it is. Yeah. So, I mean, wind I mean, the tape back because now, I think now, can you I, just said what I, I just said. I just flew around the world, okay? <laughs> and I warned you. I said, I pray to God I don't say anything stupid tonight. I just Wait a second. Stupid. Is he correct? Okay. Me? But wait, you just said what I just said. About that. So That's called jet lag. <laughs> so in the book, you talk about the anger that comes up. Yep. And then you... Yep. Then you give this, and this is what I was reading to you today. Okay. First Peter uh, 1, 6, and 7. So be truly glad. 
There is a wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. Wow. Yes. And it is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. I love that scripture. I love that scripture, and it, and it reminded me of um, an experience that I had. I've told this many times on the air, but I'll, I'll share it real quick. Um, I was in a restaurant with my kids and, and we're one of my sons and, and Matt and overlooking a restaurant and um, sitting there, Matt got up to go to the restroom and I just, with my eyes, I was just watching him and all of a sudden my world just went pitch black. So I'm sitting like there and my, it's like everything just went dark, the darkest dark black. I knew my son was sitting there. I knew Matt was in the bathroom, I wasn't having this out of body thing. It was just, there was no fear. And it was, I was in the presence of God. Wow. Even though it was the darkest dark I've ever. And it was as if, um, it was as if I was the only soul that had ever been created and it was just me and God. And I heard him say to me, he said, what do you have to bring me? And all of a sudden, my life just flashed before my eyes. Everything that I had done, everything that I had experienced was like this world that really hadn't happened. It was just like a vapor. That vapor thing was just like what I was watching. Mm -hmm. And I remember that, and this is horrible. This is what affected me so badly, is that I saw the times of struggle. So I saw the times of wilderness, wilderness in my life. And I saw the fighting. And I saw the complaining. And I saw the struggle of life. And the times that I had leaned into the negative. And it was such wasted time. Hmm. And I felt that. I wow. thought, oh my God, I wasted those were wow. wasted times that I worried, <laughs> that I fretted about things. Feared. The, yeah. That I feared things. It, it was just wasted. <laughs> and the only times that I had, so, so the only thing that I had to bring God was the times that I stood in faith. <laughs> wow. And that I said wow. who he said he was. And in the circumstances that were just totally against me in my life. And I spoke not out of fear, not out of, 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 complaining. of complaining or insecurity, but I stood up and I said, no, that's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says I am healed. The Word of God brings me joy. <laughs> this is my peace. This is my joy. This is my rock, who He said He is. And that was the only thing that I had to give God when I got there. Wow. And, and the rest was such wasted time. And I, and I said to the Lord, I said, God, let me go back. When I get back, and, and again, I have to state this, I was, I, I was raised word of faith and you had to be careful. You watched what you said. The words of your mouth meant a lot. But it made me say in my heart to the Lord, and this took a long time for me to say, <laughs> to, to even say it. Well, say it the way that. we're talking about, bring the wilderness. Yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah. It was like, God, for the rest of my time on earth, <laughs> bring it all. Bring the struggle. <laughs> bring those times that I have to stand in faith and be strong. Now, I don't want that. My flesh does not want that. But it was like bring on the moments that, that I have nothing left 
but to stand strong in who you said you are. So that you so have So that more when I to... come back for eternity, I have a armload <laughs> of faith to give you and praise to give you. And that's the only thing that was asked of me from God. <laughs> that was all he wanted was the times what that I reason? stood fa in faith and strong. That's what you're talking about tonight, to redefine a time and to speak who it is so that you get through this yeah. to accomplish something. So what if we do that? Yeah. I mean, so oh. that the glory and the praise that when he does come. So I never put that scripture with that experience. I said, so I was reading today, I was going, that's, that's that scripture. Yeah. He's written the scripture that goes with what I experienced. So what Peter I makes this statement, he says, as Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That is such a loaded scripture. Wow. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from living a selfish life, is what he's saying, right? So, but what really gets my attention is, as Christ suffers for us in the flesh, arm yourselves. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine a military going to a battle with no guns, no knives, no bullets, no tanks, no planes? It'd be ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. They'd be defeated in a day. Yeah. Yet so many Christians are not armed. When the wilderness hits, yeah. when adversity hits, uh, they go into a state of shock, a state of bewilderment, a state of amazement, and they react instead of act. Wow. Okay, now who's armed? Let, let, let's talk about somebody who's armed. The first person that comes to mind when I think of somebody who's armed is a commercial airline pilot. Mm -hmm. Every six months they have to go through recurrent training. They put them into a simulator. I've literally talked to simulator operators and they look at me with a sadistic smile and say, we throw so much junk at those guys. We throw everything at them mm -hmm. that could possibly go wrong historically that we know with a plane. And they may crash a time or two, but then they get it. So there was actually a black box recording back in the days before 2001 where a plane crashed. And it was one of the smaller planes that didn't have a door between the pilots and the passengers. When the catastrophe hit, the pilot was like, feather the engines, co pilot check, uh, pull up the landing gear, check, uh, do this, check. They could hear the passengers. They were screaming in hysteria. The pilots were armed. The passengers were unarmed. Mm -hmm. Many aviation disasters have been averted because of arming those pilots. You, the guy who saved it in the, in the Hudson River, remember? Okay, what we're doing tonight with our friends mm -hmm. is we're arming them. Thank you, Lord. By us talking about this, by what you just shared, that profoundly strengthened me to think even more. I mean, I literally, when I face dark moments, I'll remember this vision that God Thank gave Lord. you to share with the world. It will, sh it will strengthen all of us. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. We're arming you tonight so that you correctly handle. You're like the pilot. You're not reacting. You're acting. Yeah. At TBN, our mission is to use every available means to reach as many individuals and families as possible with the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for helping make the gospel of grace go around the world. Without you, we couldn't do it. God bless you.